Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Vedahi, and I'll be the MC for this session. It is my pleasure to introduce Tan Zhexian, who is a doctoral student at MIT pursuing AI alignment research in the computational cognitive science and probabilistic computing research groups. Their current focus is on inferring the latent hierarchical structure of human motivations by modeling agents as probabilistic programs with the hope of aligning AI with higher order goals, values, and principles that humans strive in part to live by. Xian also serves as a board member of EA Singapore and was formerly a lead organizer for Yale EA. Today, Xian will be giving a talk on AI alignment, philosophical pluralism, and the relevance of non-Western philosophy. We will be starting with a 15 minute talk by Xian and then move on to a live Q&A where they will respond to some of your questions. You can submit questions using the box on the right hand side of the video and also vote for your favorite questions to push them higher up the list. Without further ado, here's Shen. Hey everyone, my name is Zhi Shen or Zhi Shen, they, they, or she, her pronouns, and I'm a doctoral student at MIT doing cognitive AI research. Specifically, I work on how we can infer the hidden structure of human motivations by modeling humans using probabilistic programs. Today though, I'll be talking about something that's more in the background that informs my work. And that's about AI alignment, philosophical pluralism, and the relevance of non-Western philosophy. This talk is going to cover a lot of ground, so I want to give an overview first to keep everyone oriented. First, I'll give a brief introduction to what AI alignment is and why it likely matters as an effective cause area. I won't go too deeply into this though, so if you're new to the topic, I recommend introductory articles like those by Kelsey Piper and Vox. I'll then highlight some of the philosophical tendencies of current AI alignment research and argue that it reflects a relatively narrow set of philosophical views. Given that these views may miss crucial considerations, this motivates the need for greater philosophical and disciplinary pluralism. And then as a kind of proof by example, I'll aim to demonstrate how non-Western philosophy might provide insight into several open problems in AI alignment research. Cool, so what is AI alignment? One way to cash it out is the project of building intelligent systems that robustly act in our collective interests. In other words, building AI that's aligned with our values. As many people in the EA community have argued, this is highly impactful cause area if you believe the following. One, artificial intelligence will determine the future of our civilization, perhaps by replacing humanity as the most intelligent agents on this planet, or perhaps by having some other kind of transformative impact like enabling authoritarian dystopias. Two, the AI will be likely misaligned with our collective interests by default, perhaps because it's just very hard to specify what our values are or because of bad systemic incentives. And three, not only is the problem really difficult to solve, but we also can't wait till later to start solving it. And you know, basically everyone who works in AI alignment thinks it's a really daunting technical and philosophical challenge. Human values, whatever they are, are really complex and fragile. And so every seemingly simple solution to aligning superhuman AI is subject to potentially catastrophic loopholes. I'll illustrate this by way of this short dialogue between a human and a fictional super intelligent chatbot called GPT-5, who's kind of like this genie in a bottle. So you start out this chatbot and you ask, Dear GPT-5, please make everyone on this planet happy. And then GPT-5 replies, okay, I will place them in stasis chambers and inject them with heroin so they experience eternal bliss. No, 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 please don't do that. I mean, satisfy your preferences. Not everyone wants heroin, GPT-5. All right, but how should I figure out what those preferences are? Just listen to what they say they want or infer it from how they act. Hmm. This person says they can't bear to hurt animals, but keeps eating meat. Sounds like someone I know. Well, do what they would want to do if they could think longer or had more willpower. Very well then, I extrapolate that they will come to support human extinction to save other species. Actually, just stop. How do I know if that's what you really want? So that's a taste of the kind of problem we need to solve. Obviously, there's a lot to unpack there about like philosophy, about what people really want, about what desires are, what preferences are, and should we always satisfy those preferences? Um, who's working on solving those problems? 
um, I wanted to give a sense of what the technical AI alignment ecosystem is currently like to give it more context for what might be missing. AI alignment is actually a really small and growing field, composed of entities like MERI, FHI, OpenAI, the Alignment Forum, and so on. Most of these organizations are really young, um, mostly less than five years old. And I think it's fair to say that they've been a little insular as well. Because if you think about AI alignment as a field and the problems it's trying to solve, you think it must be this really interdisciplinary field that sits at the intersection of broader disciplines like human computer interaction, cognitive science, AI ethics, and academic philosophy. But the truth is, to my knowledge, there actually isn't very much overlap between these communities. It's more off to the side, like in this picture. There are reasons for this, which I'll get to, and it's already starting to change. But I think it partly explains the relatively narrow philosophical horizons of the AI alignment community. So what are these horizons? I'm going to lay out five philosophical tendencies that I've perceived in the work that comes out of the AI alignment community. So this is inevitably going to be a bit subjective, but it's based on the work that gets highlighted in venues like the alignment newsletter or that gets discussed in the AI alignment forum. First, there's tendency towards connectionism, the position that knowledge is restored as sub-symbolic weights in neural networks rather than language-like symbols. You see this in the emphasis on deep learning interpretability, scalability, and robustness. Second, there's a tendency towards behaviorism, that to build AI, or human-aligned AI, we can model or mimic humans as these reinforcement learning agents, which avoid reasoning or planning just by learning from lifetimes and lifetimes of data. This is in contrast to more cognitive approaches to AI, which emphasize the ability to reason and manipulate abstract mental models of the world. Third, there's an implicit tendency towards human theories of motivation. Here, that we can model humans as motivated by reward signals that they receive from the environment, which you can think of as desires or passions, as David Hume called them. This is in contrast to more Kantian theories of motivation, which leave more room for humans to also be motivated by reasons, for example, commitments or intentions or moral principles. Fourth, there's a tendency to view rationality solely in decision-theoretic terms. That is, rationality is about maximizing expected value, where probabilities are updated in a Bayesian manner. But historically, in philosophy, there's a lot more to norms of reasoning and rationality than just that. Rationality is also about logic and argumentation and dialectic. Broadly speaking, it's about what makes, it, it's about what makes sense for a person to think or do, including what makes sense for a person to value in the first place. Finally, there's an unsurprising tendency towards consequentialism. Consequentialism in the broad sense that value and ethics are about outcomes or states of the world. This excludes views that root value and ethics in evaluative attitudes or geontic norms or contractualism. Why these tendencies? Of course, it's partly that a lot of very smart people thought very hard about these things, and this is what made sense to them. But very smart people may still be systematically biased by their intellectual environments and trajectories. In particular, it's worth noting that the first three of these tendencies are very much influenced by recent successes of deep reinforcement learning and AI. In fact, prior to these successes, a lot of work in AI was more on the other end of the spectrum. First order logic, classical planning, cognitive systems, etc. And the last two of these tendencies are inherited from disciplines like economics, computer science, and communities like effective altruism. So at this point, I hope to have shown you how the AI alignment community exists in a bit of a philosophical bubble. And so in that sense, if you'll forgive the term, it's rather parochial. And there are understandable reasons for this. For one, AI alignment is still a young field and hasn't reached a more diverse pool of researchers. Until more recently, it's also been excluded and not taken very seriously within traditional academia, leading to a lack of interdisciplinary collaboration. Obviously, there are also strong founder effects due to the field's emergence within rationalist and EA communities. And like much of AI in STEM, it inherits barriers to participation from an unjust world. These can be, and in my opinion, should be addressed. As the field grows, we could make sure it includes more disciplinary and community outsiders. We could foster greater interdisciplinary collaboration within academia. We could better recognize how our founder effects may bias the search through the space of ideas. And we could lower the barriers to participation while countering unjust selection effects. But why bother? What exactly is the value in breaking out of this philosophical bubble? 
And why do I use the word pluralism in particular, as opposed to just diversity? By philosophical pluralism, I mean to include philosophical diversity, by which I mean serious engagement with multiple philosophical traditions and disciplinary paradigms. But I also mean openness to the possibility that the problem of aligning AI might have multiple good answers, and that we need to contend with how to do that. Having defined those terms, let's get into the reasons. The first is avoiding the streetlight fallacy, that if we simply keep exploring the philosophy that's familiar to Western educated elites, we are likely to miss on huge swaths of human thought that might have crucial relevance to AI alignment. The second is robustness to moral and normative uncertainty. If you're unsure about what the right thing to do is, or to align an AI towards, and you think it's plausible that other philosophical perspectives might have good answers, then it's reasonable to diversify our resources to incorporate them. The third is pluralism as a form of political pragmatism. As Yes and Gabriel writes, in the absence of moral agreement, is there a fair way to decide what principles AI should align with? Gabriel doesn't really put it this way, but one way to interpret this is that pluralism is pragmatic because it's the only way we're going to get buy-in from disparate political actors. Finally, this pluralism as an ethical commitment in itself. Pluralism as respect for the equality and autonomy of persons to choose what values and ideals matter to them. This is the reason I personally find it most compelling. I think in order to preserve a lot of what we care about in this world, we need aligned AI to respect this plurality of value. So that's why I think pluralism matters to AI alignment. Perhaps you buy that, but would like more concrete examples. So now I'd like just to offer a few. I think non-Western philosophy may be especially relevant to the following open problems in AI alignment. The first is representing and learning human norms. What are norms and how do they constrain our actions or shape our values? How do learners infer and internalize them from their social environments? Classical Chinese ethics, especially Confucian ethics, can provide some insights. The second is robustness to ontological shifts and crises. We typically value the world in terms of the objects and relations we use to represent it. But what should an agent do when its representations undergo transformative shifts? Certain schools of Buddhist metaphysics bear directly on these questions. The third is the phenomenology of valuing and disvaluing. We value different things in different ways with different subjective experiences. But are these varieties of experience, and how should they inform agents that try to learn what we value? Buddhist, Jain, and Vedic philosophy have been very much centered on these questions and could provide answers. I'm actually going to avoid going into this further, partly to keep this talk within time, but also because I think it's increasingly accepted within the West that contemplative traditions may have useful insights about these questions. Before I go on, I also wanted to note that this is primarily drawn from only the limited amount of Chinese and Buddhist philosophy that I'm familiar with. This is certainly not all of non-Western philosophy, and there's a lot more out there, outside of the streetlight, that may be relevant. So, representing and learning human norms, why might you care about this? One answer that's common from game theory is that norms have instrumental value as coordinating devices or unspoken agreements. If you look to Confucian ethics, however, you get a quite different picture. On one possible interpretation of Confucian thought, norms and practices are understood to have intrinsic value as evaluative standards and expressive acts. You can see this, for example, in the Analex. This word li is hard to translate, but it means something like ritual propriety or et etiquette, and it recurs again and again in Confucian thought. This particular line suggests a central role for ritual in what Confucians thought of as a humane and virtuous life. How to inter interpret this? Kuang Lai Shen suggests that this is because while ritual forms may just be conventions, without these conventions, important evaluative attitudes like respect or reverence cannot be made intelligible or expressed. I was quite struck by this when I first encountered it, partly because I grew up finding a lot of that stuff really pointless and oppressive. And to be clear, some norms are oppressive. But I recently encountered a very similar idea again in the work of Elizabeth Anderson, who I cited previously, that made me come around more to it. In speaking about how individuals value things and where we get these values from, she argues that individuals are not self-sufficient in their capacity to value things in different ways. I'm capable of valuing something in a particular way only in a social setting that upholds norms for that mode of valuation. And I actually find this really compelling. If you think about what constitutes good art or literature or beauty, that's undoubtedly tied up in norms and about how to value things and how to express those values. 
and this is right, then there's a sense in which the game theoretic account of norms has got things exactly reversed. In game theory, it's assumed that norms emerge out of the interaction of individual preferences, and so are secondary. But for Confucians and Anderson, it's the opposite. Norms are primary, or at least a lot of them are, and what we individually value is shaped by those norms. This was just a pretty deep reorientation of what AI alignment approaches that learned human values need to do. Rather than learn individual values and figure out how to balance them across society, we need to consider that many values are social from the outset. Next topic, robustness to ontological shifts and crises. This is actually a somewhat older problem, first posed by Miri in 2011, and it goes as follows. An agent defines his objectives based on how it represents the world. What should happen when the representation is changed? As it turns out, Buddhist philosophy might provide some answers. To see how, it's worth comparing it against commonplace views about reality and the objects within it. I think most of us would grow up as what you might call naive realists, believing that through our senses, we perceive the world and its objects directly as they are. By then, we grow up and study some science and encounter optical illusions, and maybe we become representational realists instead. We believe that we indirectly construct representations of the external world from sense data, but the world being represented out there is still real. Now, Majjhima Buddhism goes further and rejects the idea that there's anything ultimately real or true. Instead, all facts are at best conventionally true. And while there may exist some external reality, there's no uniquely privileged representation of that world that is the correct one. However, some representations are better for alleviating suffering than others. And so part of the goal of Buddhist practice is to see through our everyday representations as merely conventional and to adopt representations better suited for alleviating suffering. This view is demonstrated quite remarkably in the Vimalakirti Sutra, which actually uses gender as an example of a concept that we need to see through as conventional. I was quite astounded when I first read it, because the topic feels so current, but the text is actually 1800 years old. All this actually quite closely resonates, in my opinion, with a recent movement in Western analytic philosophy called conceptual engineering, the idea that we should re-engineer concepts to suit our purposes. For example, Sally Hasslanger at MIT has applied this approach in her writings on gender and race, arguing that we need to revise concepts like those to better suit feminist and anti-racist ends. I think this methodology is actually a really promising way to deal with the question of ontological shifts. It almost suggests this iterative algorithm for changing our representations of the world, as shown on the screen. Whether this would work or would lead to reasonable outcomes is, I think, really open research terrain. With that, I'll end my world to tour of non-Western philosophy and offer some key takeaways and steps forward. What I hope to have shown with this talk is that AI alignment has drawn from a relatively narrow set of philosophical perspectives. Expanding the set, for example, with non-Western philosophy can provide fresh insights and reduce the risk of misalignment. In order to address this, I'd like to suggest that prospective researchers and funders in AI alignment should consider a wider range of disciplines and approaches. Also, while support for alignment research has grown in CS departments, we may need to increase support in other fields in order to foster the interdisciplinary expertise needed for this daunting challenge. With that, if you enjoyed this talk and would like to learn more about AI alignment, pluralism, or non-Western philosophy, here are some recommended readings. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions.